Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at verses 5 and 6, and this is going to be our launch pad for our message today because this was the first declaration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter began nearly 2,000 years ago with an angel declaring that Jesus was alive. Look at Matthew 28, beginning of verse 5. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. And so this is Jesus. He is alive. This is Jesus. He's resurrected from the dead. This is Jesus risen forevermore. A few years ago, there was an interesting article in Newsweek magazine, and the title of that article was this, Rethinking the Resurrection. I want to just read a short quote from that, that article. It said this, By any measure, the resurrection of Jesus is the most radical of Christian doctrines. Jesus' teaching, his compassion for others, even his martyr's death, all find parallels in other religious traditions. But of no other historical figure has the claim been persistently made that God raised him from the dead. Now, I want to let you know something. On this, Newsweek magazine got it exactly right. There is no other religion. There is no other tradition. There is no other faith that has made the persistent claim that their founder, that their leader, was dead and came back to life. But this morning, I want us to ask and answer this question. Here's the question. Did Jesus really do it? Did Jesus really come back from death? Did he really rise from the dead? If so, what difference does that make? What difference does that make for us personally? What difference does that make globally? Did he really do it? I remember the angel said to the women at the tomb, Jesus is risen just as he said he would. The reason the angel said that is because while Jesus was alive, he was predicting to both enemies and to friends that he would be resurrected from the dead. He predicted it to his enemies. He predicted it to his friends. He predicted it to the religious leaders. He predicted it to his closest disciples. In fact, to the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, I want you to notice what Jesus said. He said, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus told his enemies he was going to be resurrected, and Jesus told his friends. Notice what he said in Matthew 16 to his disciples. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And it's because of Jesus' own prediction that he would in fact be resurrected from the dead that after he was crucified, after he was dead, and after he was buried, his enemies went to the government. They went to Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor over that region. And notice what they said to Pilate in Matthew 27. Sir, we remember how that imposter, speaking of Jesus, how that imposter, while he was still alive, said this, after three days, I will rise. I mean, think about it. 2,000 years ago, if you lived in Israel, if you happened to be in Jerusalem, you knew this was the prediction. I mean, it would have been like living in the 60s and saying, uh, Vietnam War, what is that? You would know. It'd be like living in the 70s and say, Watergate scandal, what is that? Early 2000s, 9-11, never heard of it. Uh, 2020, COVID-19, what are you talking about? All these things are common knowledge. Friends, in Jerusalem, in Israel, it was common knowledge that Jesus predicted he would rise from the dead. But here's the question. Did he really do it? I mean, did he really do it? Did it really happen? Four things on your outline I want you to see. You can grab that out of the bulletin. The first piece of compelling proof is this. Number one, the proof of the squad of soldiers. The proof of the squad of soldiers. You may not know this, but there was actually a squad of Roman soldiers that were dispatched to guard the tomb of Jesus so that his body would not be stolen, so that this rumor of his resurrection would not be fabricated. At least that's what the religious leaders thought. 
We read already verse 63 of Matthew 27. I want to read it again and read after that. Here's what the Bible says. They're speaking to Pilate. Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he's risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. So Pilate reminds them, hey, I've already dispatched a a squad of soldiers for your use. And you have the discretion to use that squad however you want to use them. Now, history tells us that a squad of Roman soldiers would have been about 15 enlisted men and one officer. And what do the religious leaders do? They send those 15, relig- those 15 soldiers to the tomb of Jesus with that officer to guard the grave so nothing would be stolen. Now, here's what's interesting, is that if a Roman soldier lost a prisoner that he was guarding, he would pay a penalty with his life. He would die. Even a dead prisoner, if you lost that prisoner, you paid with your life. We, we know this is the case a little later in the Bible, in the book of Acts, the history book of the New Testament. We have an event where Paul was imprisoned and a, an angel blew open the doors of that jail. And whenever the jailer awoke, he was also a Roman soldier. Look what the Bible says he was about to do, Acts 16, 27. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Well, why in the world would this Roman soldier, this jailer, want to commit suicide? Because he knew if he lost those prisoners, he was already a dead man and likely by a torturous, excruciatingly painful means. And so he figured, well, I'll save myself the indignity and the dishonor and the pain and suffering, and I'll just kill myself. In light of all this, in light of how serious it is for Roman soldiers to keep guard of their prisoners, even dead prisoners, do you think a bunch of women and fishermen could beat down some battle-hardened Roman soldiers and steal away the body of Jesus. Absolutely not. The thought is preposterous, but that's exactly what we see from the Bible, that his body was not stolen, he was resurrected. And that's the first piece of evidence that is the proof of the squad of soldiers. Here's the second piece of evidence, the proof of religious rulers. We have the evidence of Jesus' enemies and their reaction after word of the resurrection began to be spread among Jerusalem. After word is out, this Jesus is alive. He's appearing. Well, how did they react? What did the religious rulers do to squash that rumor? Well, the Bible tells us what they did in Matthew 28. Look at verse 11, the links they went through to cover it up. It says this, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. I don't know if you know this or not, but government corruption has existed forever. (laughs) There's government corruption here. First, they're paying off the Roman soldiers. We're paying you off to go spread this rumor that the disciples came and stole his body. And by the way, if word gets back to Pontius Pilate, the governor over this region, and you're going to get in trouble, guess what? We'll pay him off too. We'll satisfy him as well. This is amazing. The Jewish leaders are willing to go through all these hoops and all this suppression because of this rumor about Jesus being resurrected from the dead. Why did they go through all that trouble? I mean, all they had to do to prove that Jesus was not resurrected was simply go down to the garden tomb, roll away the, the, to- the stone, pull out Jesus's dead body, and display it on the streets of Jerusalem for all the world to see. Why didn't they ju- just do that? Here's why they didn't do that. There was no dead body in that tomb. Jesus was alive. He'd been resurrected from the dead. He was gone. And so we see evidence, proof, that Jesus was really resurrected, not only because of the squad of soldiers that was guarding the tomb, 
but because of the links the religious rulers went through to try to suppress that truth. Here's the third thing I want us to see. Number three, the proof of eyewitness evidence. The proof of eyewitness evidence. Now, what I've been doing this morning is something like what attorneys do in a court of law. I've been presenting to you evidence. I've been presenting to you proof. And one compelling piece of evidence in any court of law is that of an eyewitness account. Somebody that saw the deed go down. Somebody that saw things happen. Now, if you happen to go to law school and you want to become a lawyer, you will be required to take some courses on evidence the procedures surrounding evidence, how you present evidence, the rules of evidence. And one volume that is uh, non-dispensable in this study is called Phipson on Evidence. It's an 1,832-page volume if you want to do some nighttime reading. And in that, he tells you how you can use evidence in our legal system. I want to read a short quote from Phipson on Evidence to see what he says about eyewitness testimony. He says this, As a general rule, courts may act on the testimony of a single witness, and where that testimony is unimpeached, they should act on it. However, he goes on to say, corroboration by other witnesses is always desirable as it can turn a probability into a certainty. You see what Phipson is saying? If you've just got one eyewitness who is a credible witness, it's a probability that what they saw is true, and you can submit that as evidence in a court of law. But if you've got two witnesses or three witnesses or four or ten, well, that moves it from a probability to a certainty. So here's the thing. When it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, friends, there's not just one eyewitness. There's not just two. There's not just ten. There are hundreds of eyewitnesses who claim they saw Jesus alive after he was killed and buried in a tomb. Let me give you one example from the book of 1 Corinthians. This is the exact point Paul is making in chapter 15. He writes this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what, was all, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, Then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Paul is saying, friends, it's common knowledge. Everybody knows. Jesus appeared not just to a couple people, but to hundreds of people, many at one time. In fact, he said there, most of whom are still alive. In other words, if you don't believe me, go ask them yourselves. They're still walking around giving the same testimony that they actually saw Jesus alive. In fact, they're in Jerusalem. Just a few weeks after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the church was gathered there, 120 believers, 120 disciples. It was during the Jewish festival known as Pentecost. And Peter preached to all the thousands and thousands of Jewish pilgrims there in Jerusalem about what was taking place. And notice what he said in part in verse 15. He says, You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we, plural, are witnesses he's the spokesman for the 120 people in the upper room he says guess what we are all witnesses we're giving our testimony that jesus was dead and he is now alive now you may say but hold on a second troy maybe this they're just all a bunch of liars maybe this is just the biggest hoax that's ever been put on humanity maybe this is just some big con game maybe they're con artists con men con women Well, that brings to the fourth and final piece of proof I want us to see. Number four, the proof of disciples' deaths. I want us to consider the proof of the disciples' deaths. This is the evidence of the martyrdom that these disciples who claim to have seen Jesus resurrected from the dead, they died cruel, vicious deaths without ever recanting or renouncing this claim. First, in Acts chapter 7, we have the martyrdom, the first Christian martyr. His name was Stephen. Notice how they killed him. Then they cast him, that's Stephen, out of the city and stoned him. In other words, they pelted Stephen with rocks until they beat the life out of him. And he would never recant or renounce that he saw Jesus alive 
after he had been crucified and buried. You move forward into Acts chapter 12, we see some more disciples who were martyred, who were killed. It says this about James and others. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now, history tells us that all of the original 12 disciples, including Paul, were martyred for their faith in Jesus, except for John. He was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. We know that Paul himself was killed by the emperor Nero through beheading. We know that Peter was killed through crucifixion, but not right side up. He was crucified upside down. And Peter is an interesting case study. If you think about Peter, here's someone who walked with Jesus for three years. He heard the teaching. He saw the miracles. He experienced the healing, so much so that he said to Jesus, Jesus, all these other jokers may fall by the wayside. They may deny you. I'll never deny you. But if you know the story, you know what happened. There he is by a fire, warming himself, and a little girl comes by and says, hey, I think you were one of his disciples, right? And he denied it with cursing. Three times he denied the Lord. But guess what? He died a martyr's death. What changed? I'll tell you what changed. He saw Jesus alive after he saw him dead. The resurrection is what changed Peter and his testimony. When push came to shove, he was willing to die. So how do we explain this? How do we explain the willingness of these people, all of them, would not renounce their testimony, their eyewitness testimony, they saw the resurrected Christ. How do you explain it? It wasn't a con game, because here's the deal. If somebody's running a con game, at some point when the pressure comes in, somebody's going to cave. Somebody's going to turn state's evidence and say, okay, I, I want to get off scot-free. Let me tell you how we, we did the whole thing. None of them ever did that. Some of you may have heard of Charles Colson. Charles Colson was the special counsel for President Richard Nixon. In other words, he was the top personal attorney for the President of the United States. As such, he had inside information into everything going on in the Nixon administration, including the whole Watergate scandal. And after the scandal was exposed, God used that experience to expose Charles Colson's personal sin and lostness before God. And he became a Christian. He surrendered to Jesus Christ and trusted in him. And it was part of this evidence about these eyewitnesses who were willing to be killed that convinced him the gospel was true. In fact, I want you to hear it from his own words, his unique perspective as an attorney. He said this, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. This evidence of the deaths of these disciples, that they went to their brutal deaths, to the grave, not denying. You see, people will die for a lie. Muslim extremists die for the lie of Islam every day. But people don't die for a lie they make up. They cave. They give in. They say, okay, I was just kidding. These people aren't lying. They went to their graves, never denying they saw Jesus dead, buried, and resurrected from the dead. They had talked with Jesus. They had touched Jesus. They saw Jesus. So let's summarize. The fact of the resurrection is the foundation of the Christian faith. It is the basis for why we are here today and why we are here every Sunday, that we believe Jesus is alive and I gave you four compelling pieces of proof. The first is the proof of the Roman soldiers that they were battle-hardened soldiers and fishermen and women couldn't get by them. I gave you the proof of the enemies of Jesus, the, the religious rulers, how they did all they could to squash this rumor that Jesus was alive. All they had to do was present the body. They didn't. 
because they couldn't. I gave you the evidence of the eyewitnesses, hundreds of eyewitnesses, never once recanting their testimony that they saw Jesus alive, so much so that I gave you the evidence of their death, their martyrdom. They went to the grave, often with brutal deaths, claiming they saw the resurrection of Jesus. I believe I've given enough evidence this morning to prove to you beyond any reasonable doubt that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Now, we use this phrase in our legal system here in the United States, beyond a reasonable doubt, and and I wanted to get my mind wrapped around what does this mean? What is this proof that you have demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt? So I thought, if only I knew somebody who was in law school that I could call and ask this question to. Well, I do. I have my daughter, Amber, who's 23. She's in law school in Virginia. So I called her last week, and I asked her, give me some explanation on evidence and on this weight of evidence called beyond a reasonable doubt. It just so happened that a few weeks ago, uh, she and her other law students there were part of a prosecution team in a mock trial. And they were presenting the evidence in a case of assault in the first degree. And in that case, they were giving several witnesses, and they were presenting the information to what would be a jury. Amber actually got to give the closing argument, the closing statement of their case. And so she sent me what her closing statement was, and I quote it today. She said this, and I quote, The prosecution does not take lightly that we have the burden of proof in this case. The burden to prove to you, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the accused is guilty of assault in the first degree. Beyond a reasonable doubt is like a jigsaw puzzle. Once you have enough pieces, there is no longer any doubt about what you're looking at. Our three eyewitnesses knew what they were looking at. After considering all of the evidence we've presented, the pieces of the puzzle make it clear. You know what you're looking at as well. The accused is guilty of assault in the first degree. She's pretty smart. (laughs) Now, I love that illustration that she gave. She talked about a jigsaw puzzle. You don't have to have all the pieces of the puzzle in place to know what you're looking at. In fact, look at this next slide. Not all the pieces of the puzzle there, but what is that? Mount Rushmore. Look at the next one. What is that? It's a Tennessee Aquarium. You've got lots of pieces that are not in place. But you can look at what there, what's there, and beyond any reasonable doubt, you know exactly what you're looking at. Listen, this morning, I, I just gave you four pieces of the puzzle. And although we may not have every piece, we're 2,000 years removed from the event. Look at this next slide. We know what we're looking at. We see the pieces of the puzzle that are presented in history and in the Bible and in eyewitness testimony. It is beyond a reasonable doubt Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Now, if that's true, and it is, it changes everything. Friends, this evidence changes everything. We've talked about, did Jesus really do it? That was the question So what are the implications here? Here's some implications if Jesus really did it. First of all, his claims to be God in human flesh, it's true. Jesus is God. Second thing, if it is really true that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, then friends, this life is not all there is. There is an eternity. There is an afterlife. And Jesus talked about it. Here's the third thing. It's fundamental about if this is true And it is is that Jesus' plan of salvation is the only one. It's the only one. In the time we've got left, I want to ask this question. How is Jesus' plan of rescue, plan of salvation for humanity, how is it unique? How is it different? Well, there's at least four ways that I see Jesus' plan of salvation is different than all other concepts of religious leaders. I've got them on the back of your outline if you want to follow along. The first way that Jesus' plan is unique is this. His plan is not by human achievement. Jesus' plan is not by human achievement. And I think it's important to point out, every other plan of salvation is based on what you do. It's based on human achievement. I don't care who it is. Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, L. Ron Hubbard, Uh, Mary Baker Eddy, Joseph Smith, all those religious systems, 
They're all based on what you do or don't do. This list of rules that you keep, this code of conduct that you follow, your merit. Friends, the, the gospel, the message of Jesus is it's not based on your human achievement. If you come to the pearly gates of heaven and you knock, hey, I'd really love to come in. Why should I let you in? Well, look at all this good stuff I've done. I mean, after all, don't you have some great scale over there that shows that my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds? You know what God's going to say? No, you cannot come in. Because your admittance into heaven is not based upon human achievement. This is exactly what the Bible says in Romans 3.20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. Not a single one. This is completely different than every other religious system. So not only is Jesus' plan of salvation one that's not based on human achievement, secondly, his plan is through divine accomplishment. His plan is through divine accomplishment. So if it's not based on what we do, if it's not based on how good we are, if it's not based on us keeping some rules or some code of conduct, what is it based on? It's based on him. It's based on his merit. It's based on his work, his life, his death, his burial, and resurrection. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul said in Titus chapter 3. He said, he saved us. Jesus saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. No, that could never save us. But according to his mercy. What's his mercy? His divine accomplishment. What he did in our place. You see, the merits of Jesus, the work of Jesus, that's the only thing that can make us acceptable to God. That's the only thing, is what Christ has done. When we show up at the pearly gates, will we be trusting in our own merits, or will we trust in the righteous work of Jesus, his death as a substitute, his burial, proving that he was truly dead, and his resurrection to provide new life? to all who trust in him. But don't miss this third characteristic of Jesus' plan of salvation. His plan is absolute. His plan is absolute. What does that mean? There's not another plan. There's not another road. There's not another process. This is exclusive. And I'm not saying that. Jesus said it. Notice what Jesus said in John 14, verse 6. Jesus himself said, I am the, definite article, the way, and the truth, and the life. Say these next two words with me. No one. Let's try that again. No one. That's all inclusive. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you see how absolutely exclusive Jesus' plan is? No one. Which is why Acts 4.12 says this, something very similar. The Bible says, and there is salvation in, say those two words, no. no one. There's salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now you may be thinking, hold on, Troy, stop right there. This is 2024. I mean, come on. You got to be inclusive, Troy. You got to have diversity and inclusion and equity you got to look the same at all these different systems you can't be so absolute and exclusive i'm not jesus is he's the one that said his way is the only way the exclusive way and you think about it as we celebrate our savior today on easter we do not make a pilgrimage to a tomb we don't have to Muslims, they make a pilgrimage to Muhammad's tomb. Why? He's still there. Jews make a pilgrimage to Abraham's tomb. Why? He's still there. Buddhists make a pilgrimage to Buddha's tomb and other Buddhist teachers' tombs. Why? They're still there. We don't make any such pilgrimage. We don't have to because Jesus is not there. He's alive. And that leads to the fourth and final way Jesus' plan of salvation is unique. Number four, his plan must be personally, personally applied. Jesus gave his life for the sins of the whole world. 
but the application of his work must be personally applied. Here's what Jesus said in John eleven twenty six. 26, interestingly, when he's walking to a funeral. He said this, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. I want you to circle that word believes on your outline. Because often we hear that word, we see that word, we read that word, and we kind of bring in our understanding of what it means to believe. The biblical word for believe is much deeper and much more impactful than when we say believe often. Often when we say believe, I believe, we're saying we agree to a set of facts. When we say we believe, we're saying, well, that's true and it's not false. It's an intellectual assent. But the word for believe, this verb, is very powerful. It means to trust in something. It means to rely. It means to depend completely. It's not just assenting to a set of facts or agreeing that something is true rather than false. It is complete trust. It is complete dependence. That's why often in the New Testament, the word repent is coupled with this word believe. Repent means a change of mind. You change your mind about who you are. You change your mind about who God is. You change your mind about what it means to live. You repent and you believe, you trust, you cling to, you rely upon. Now what I want to do in just a moment is if you've never repented and believed in Jesus, if you've never placed your faith completely in Jesus who died for you, who took the penalty in your place, then I want to give you that opportunity in just a moment. But before I do that, I want you to see my last thought. It's this. This is Jesus, the resurrected Savior who is even now calling you to surrender to him. 